Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Deciphering My Experience. My name is Eric, and I have the pleasure of being on air today with Dennis Sant, who is an experiencer and an author. He wrote a book called The Other Side of Connecting the Cosmic Dots, which is a title I fell in love with as soon as I heard it, because most of you out there know that I am certainly on a mission to help people connect the dots. So Dennis, thank you very much for joining us today. How are you doing? I am doing fine, and thank you very much for having me on your show. Mm -hmm. I've been uh, anxious and excited to uh, speak with you about this, and uh, the opportunity to share something unusual that happened not only once in a person's life, but it seems to be connecting the dots when I was a young boy. And I'll probably just start off with that, if that's okay with you, Eric. Yes, that that's and, fantastic. Uh, bring us bring us back okay. to the beginning, Dennis. Where did where okay. did your where did your experience of cosmic dots begin? Oh, good question. I like the way you framed it. It began when I was about nine years old. Uh, I had a visitation of it looked like a young boy in my room who had a conversation with me. And the boy was very different from most of the young boys I knew from my neighborhood. Uh, he was uh, about my height, a little under five feet, and uh, he had a very grayish blue complexion. Uh, he had large eyes that seemed to slam back like oriental eyes, maybe a little bit bigger than that. And um, we were having a conversation where he was saying, don't be afraid, be at peace. You know, you and I are connected. We're like cousins. And because I grew up in an area where I lived real close to all of my cousins and my grandparents on both sides uh, lived in the same little village. And so I, I did not grow up in a place that I was under pressure. I wasn't bullied. I mean, if anybody bullied me, it was, it was one of my own cousins. So with a lot of relationships, which was important, because after this visitation I had, and it went on for quite some time, I ended up with my grandmother in her bedroom. And I just got to tell you about her bedroom. Mm -hmm. My grandmother owned a restaurant bar, so she had a large bedroom, and we all lived over this restaurant. And in her bedroom, you, on one wall would be, it looked like a church. She had an altar and candles and a place for people to kneel down and pray. And the other uh, wall was filled with all of these beautiful dolls that she made all types of clothing for. She was a great seamstress. And then on the other wall were jars and jars of herbs. They filled um, maybe 50 jars of herbs. So after this visitation, she called me in a room and she told me a story when she was a little girl being raised by her grandmother in the rainforest of uh, Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. uh, my grandmother is a descendant from the Tiano Indian tribe that uh, inhabit that part of the island. Mm -hmm. And she told me about her grandmother, who really brought her up because her mother passed away during childbirth from an illness. And all these illnesses, according to my grandmother, came from Christopher Columbus. So uh, she wasn't a big fan of old Chris, although I always thought he was a great guy. We got off from school and uh, told, uh, uh, told me a story of how her grandmother, um, after, which would be my great-grandmother, um, after an illness, uh, losing her mother, who was a healer in the, in the uh, panel Indian tribe, uh, she became this healer. And she was prompted by and taught by one of these beings that I ran into. She described it almost like I had seen it that hours ago. Hmm. And we went on for a conversation well into the night on how this being uh, became friends with her grandmother and uh, taught her how to go out into the forest, out into the jungles and uh, and pick up herbs and what type of herbs to pick up you know there's over 300 medical herbal plants in the rainforest that we don't even use because we use chemicals yep and uh she was taught the secrets 
of how to brew these and teas and how to take them and put a leaf in a uh, boiling water and a towel over your head and open up all your sinuses. And we weren't, uh, she had a remedy for every sickness there was, mm -hmm. but she had a story to tell and we talked through the night. The next day uh, was a family day in uh, what we know as our paradise, Peach Lake. And there were all my cousins and my grandfather. And during the afternoon, he called me over and he said, uh, can I talk to you for a bit? He said, your father told me about an incident that happened last night. He said, I want to share with you a story when I was a young boy. And he was raised, as I told you before, by the uh, Order of Jesuits on the island of Malta. Everybody was a Catholic. Mm -hmm. and uh, they used no birth control, so he was number nine and, uh, in his sibling. He's been and, to Malta? Uh, pardon? Has your father been to Malta? Is that what you said? Uh, the, the one I'm talking about, my grandfather, he oh, lived in Malta. Your, okay, sorry. So your grandfather he lived in Malta. Lived in Malta. And he was, and he, okay. Yeah, they couldn't afford him the family, so uh -huh. they... Um, uh, allowed the order of Jesuits to bring him up to age 12. Oh, wow. So, uh, yeah. And, uh, and at age 12, he started working as a merchant marine in the Mediterranean and uh, mm -hmm. as a um, uh, cabin boy and then grew up to be part of the crew. And, and he would go back and forth between the Mediterranean and St. Lawrence, Old Tool, Seaway, and Man. into Chicago with goods from Greek and he's Greece like one of the last, one else. of the last of the old school sailors. Yeah, yeah, and he dreamt and dreamed that one day he wanted to come and live in this land of opportunity, where the streets were paved in gold, and and everybody had a yard and everybody had a job. And one of the uh, uh, my grandfather would swear that. Our family tree came from the Phoenicians. He had the sea in his blood. He would say he lived off of the sea. And so, uh, your your grandfather was this sailing man. My from the my, island of Malta. My great grandfather was a ship's carpenter sailor. He wound up retiring into Sullivan County, Catskills. They're about the exact same in age. Sullivan County. <laughs> I bet you they're about the same age, because you're you you're a gener are. you're a generation off from me. You're my father's age. I am, mm -hmm. and I look like your father's age too. But I, I am the Catskills. I I took two years of business school in Sull Sullivan Community College right there, and I worked <clears> all the divorce belts. There you go. Uh, I started later. I frequented. But, uh, I frequented Sullivan County Catskills my entire youth. There's a town there called Jeffersonville I would go to quite often. Ah, uh, Monticello and yes. Fallsburg, South Fallsburg is where I hung yeah. my hat. You ever go to the Stone Arch Bridge on 52? Absolutely. There you go. Absolutely. And did you ever go in the Never Sink? You throw yes. a stone in there and it never sinks. <laughs> Anyhow, back to... So that to to my story. I don't know where we left off. Um, your my your grandfather your grandfather and my Malta. grandmother from Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. and both families met in the Bronx. And I was born in 1947 in Bronx Hospital. We moved to a uh, to this gorgeous little never never land in Golden's Bridge, and when I moved again, we moved a little further north to the metropolis, actually it's a village also, of Brewster, New York. And actually this is where I enlisted in the United States Air Force in 1968. And I was blessed. I uh, was stationed at Maxwell Air Force Base in Montgomery, Alabama. It's known as the showcase of the Air Force and it's where the Air War College was. And I was assigned to a top secret project called Corona Harvest. And there has never been another uh, project like this in the Air Force ever conducted. No Operation Blue Book, no Morphin, nothing. This was it. This was a primo. And uh, what we did was uh, take all the reports uh, that unfolded during the period of 68 and 
for me anyhow, to 71, and investigated uh, interference during many of the battles or observations during the, many of the battles of UFOs, or what they call them in a lot of the reports, bogeys. And um, we didn't use the term UFOs that often. It just sounded like a weird thing with little green people around. And uh, so for three years, I was, I had availability to some of the greatest uh, minds in, in the Air Force. And the people that served on these panels were all active combat pilots. And I listened to their stories on uh, what we would call Wednesday barbecue night, where we'd sit and have a few beers and, uh, and the great steak. And the general would uh, take off his... Uh, stars and become a real human being, so to speak. And they would talk often about uh, sightings of bogeys, even alien type encounters. And which just fascinated me because the only book I read over and over again was Chariot of the Gods, uh, Eric Ron Zanigan. And uh, I love this guy. And uh, now I'm sitting and, and looking at all these reports from some of the greatest minds in the military telling me that there are uh, beings from and teaming from all over the galaxy that has come to this earth. Dennis, let, let me ask you so, a question, Dennis. When I'll you when you too. say when you say that the pilots are telling you the stories of bogies. But then you made a yeah. distinction that they also you said or you said or like an alien encounter. What what's the difference between a bogey encounter and an alien encounter? The bogey would be an unidentified object in the sky. An alien would be some form of a being uh, that you could see, like a person like me, like the visitation I had in my room. Okay. As a matter of fact, many of them that. Uh, said they knew of or one that had an encounter with an alien, described them very similar to the way I describe them in my book. Okay, but they were describing this so during what, their what active duty service? But they, they were discussing this during their, their act. They weren't discussing stuff about their, 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 their history prior to being in service. They were discussing things with you. You're talking about alien encounters while in service. Alien encounters while they were fighter pilots in Korea, Vietnam, and Southeast Asia. Got gotcha. you. These, cool. these people were pulled off of duty to serve on these panels. Pulled off of duty yes. to serve on a panel that was discussing that they had well, it's, encounters it's, with UF. I'm sorry, with alien species. That's a, I'm trying to figure out, I guess, like any any story, I'm trying to figure out how a pilot, I mean, I, I follow the idea that a pilot gets in his plane, he goes on shift, right? He Whether he's a, a chopper pilot, a, a fixed wing pilot. I know the whole idea of them going out and seeing a UFO and lights in the skies. That totally makes sense to me. But what you're saying to me is a new concept that they're saying that they had alien species. Alien concept. That's Could you explain to me in any capacity how that went down ever? Just in any vague, you don't have to give names, but just I don't understand. Did the did the alien come into the cockpit? No, no, not at all. Please, please understand that when we talk UFOs or bogeys, we're talking about an object that can't be identified by the knowledge that we have. I got Does you. That come from Russia? Does that come from the United States? No, nobody could fly like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, an encounter with a being would be an encounter with somebody just like you. We're having an encounter right now. It would be the same thing. It wasn't that somebody appeared in the cockpit. It would be that somebody was on the battlefield or on the ground. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. So it could have been it could have been a foot soldier instead of a pilot then. Absolutely. Got you. Got you. Absolutely. I guess I was I was but, focusing in on the pilot part too much. I guess. So you well, were dealing with all personnel and... Oh, that, and I'm glad you asked that question because it wasn't... There were seven different panels. Gotcha. My panel was called Re Research and Development. It was to take a lot of these things and to uh, indicate they're, they're, they were false reports or true reports. Other uh, panels dealt with different aspects of the war in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. The the project was a whole scope 
Gotcha. What I did was selective. I was just there for these five panel members, whatever they desired. Across the hall were five other panel members with an NCO sergeant that did their business and on and on till we come to number seven. I have a curiosity question in regards to okay. the program. You're, you're looking for things. I know that some intel you, you cross-reference with other departments, so to say. I know that there were aircraft carriers off the coast of Vietnam doing flight operations. That's Navy. Would you guys, like, let's, so obviously a, a carrier is doing what a carrier does. Um, so there are times where I'm sure there are things on their radar that are out of the ordinary. Would that type of stuff be communicated back and forth into the program that you are in? Well, that's a good question. I would say the reports that we housed at a hangar we call the vault uh, covered all the branches of the service. Okay. Um, but there, because they overlapped in their operations, mm -hmm. you you picked up reports whether they were from the Navy pilots or okay. or from the ground uh, ground pounders mm -hmm. or where, whoever they were. So there was a lot of cross information. My job was basically they would give me in the morning a list of documents to pick up, and I would get into my car, drive across base, and uh, pick up those documents. And uh, uh, they would write notes, and I worked on a uh, piece of equipment called the MTST machine and uh, a, a, very, a real rough computer backed by IBM and transcribed a lot of what they were note-taking onto these uh, tapes. Okay. That, and, 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 and probably the most important sensitive job I had was making the coffee. That coffee was made four to five times a day. They started in there at eight o'clock and they didn't leave till seven, eight o'clock that evening. They worked hard. And, I, and I so did I. I know yeah. those types of environments where when that yeah. coffee pot is empty, heads roll. Yeah. Uh, uh, funny story i had finally got a long weekend off and uh i left early on a friday afternoon and i didn't come back until tuesday the coffee had never been made they were they were drinking coffee out of what was left there on friday they, they couldn't even make a pot of coffee they were so busy <laughs> in their research i looked in there i said there's fungus in here but uh yeah so i i enjoyed my time uh, in the Air Force, it opened up another dimension. Then when I came home, I got very involved in government. Mm -hmm. I ran for some very I want to uh, jump in position. I want to jump in Pardon? before we I want to jump in before we get to the government part, just to clarify okay. what what you just said for the audience. I mean, because this is, you know, look at the world that we're in right now with the government uh -huh. disclosure as presented. You of yeah. all people know that what they present is a farce. That they've certainly, oh, they certainly have. I was, I was ashamed of what they presented. Right. I get more information from a comic book. Right. Yeah. How how dare they say we're opening up our records? Police. That's a they, joke. There was a whole hangar. You know how big an Air Force hangar is. Of course, you must know mm -hmm. it's huge. Mm -hmm. So one of those hangars called the Vault held all of these documents. You mm -hmm. could, you could get lost in it. Right. Hanger going up and down the aisles. Mm -hmm. Basically, yeah. they cherry so, picked. They cherry picked a whole bunch of non stories to say, "Look, we disclosed that we have no stories." Well, yeah, not in that box of nothing. Like you said, there's a whole yeah. hanger of all kinds of interesting stories they could divulge the truth and disclose the truth with, if they choose to do so. You know what? Just be, be, before I do move on, let's just stay on this point just for a little bit more, okay? Okay. You're now sitting in a room with great minds, war minds, combat-tested pilots. Why would they lie? Why would any of these people lie? For what reason? Not one of them become a millionaire. Right. There's no point I to haven't it. Bought, I haven't sold enough books to take my wife out to a great dinner. So... Nobody's doing it to be rich or famous. Right. I tiptoed around for so many years because I was a government official for 33 years that I was afraid to tell my story. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And when it did come out and I was 
county clerk at the time, the newspaper used that. Oh, you know that guy? He saw a little green man over here. I didn't want to tell nobody. So it wasn't until after I had been in government. Mm -hmm. I started in 1978, almost right out of the Air Force. I got involved, and I served in some wonderful, prestigious positions as a uh, commissioner of motor vehicles, uh, Putnam County, of uh, the county clerk, clerk to the Supreme and County Courts, and um, and I'm very proud of all that. Why in the world would I or any of these people lie? And that's the thing that killed me. Dur during that time uh, when I was serving in government, are we on government now? Sure. When I was serving in government, yeah. um, It, it was all about your character. You know, I didn't want people to think that I was a little bit odd, but I was just itching to tell my story. Mm -hmm. So when this started to break, and I think in 1984 was the Hudson Valley UFO phenomena, I had gotten involved and uh, I I had been contacted by a lot of the media because of who I was. And I agreed to one interview with a, uh, the Gannett newspapers, hate them. And I said, if you don't use my name, I will tell you all what happened the night I saw a city of lights floating in the sky. And I did. Took them through the whole thing. My neighbors out there screaming. The, the Interstate 84 turned into a parking lot. Mm -hmm. uh, there were sirens and cop cars. And it wasn't that I was a guy in Nebraska who saw a little object in the sky and go, oh, I wondered, is that a UFO? No. No, 7,000 people saw this. Mm -hmm. Give me a break. The vice president of IBM saw it officers, police officers, mm -hmm. mayors. Why do these people? Nobody's a millionaire. Right. What did they get off the line? So I embraced all of this and being a part of it. So that took me into uh, a government. And from there, uh, I ended up on all the talk shows, whether it was Good Morning America with uh, Regis Philbin and Kathy Lee. I go back that far. Oh, yeah, I remember uh, that one. You know, people are, are talking, mm -hmm. and uh, Discovery Magazine, we had a debate on, on, on the show, the conferences where mm -hmm. people travel across the country just to get in my face and, and tell me they were, their father was a good old preacher in uh, no uh, such thing as Alabama, aliens. and uh, it was his mission to say, well, you know, Satan's the prince of the air, so you are, you know, dealing with some pretty evil uh, situations over here. I, these people would wait for me in backstage mm -hmm. or when I get when I got out in public. I knew this was going to happen. That's why I didn't write my book until now. Mm -hmm. I'm retired. Nice. And now I say to myself, do I want the end of my life to come? Do I want my grandchildren, one of them, I have 18, one of them just might have and uh, a, a visitation. I don't want them to be scared of this. And I guess what also upsets me, Eric, and I just got to come out and tell you this, that every time somebody talks about alien beings, they are horrible looking. They look so evil and sinister, and they are here to take over our world. Well, my friend, with their technology, if they wanted to do that, they could have done that generations ago. I, b I believe it. I mean, there's nothing stopping you know? them. So, so, so it, 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 after I get off your show today, trust me, I'm not going to go out and buy a Lexus. I have a 2005 Jeep, and I'm very happy with that. And I don't expect to be the next millionaire of Putnam County, New York. But I do expect to be heard, and I have a story to tell. And I want people to have a conversation over this story. I love it. And and and, and here's what really breaks my heart. He, I asked my grandfather, because of this visitation, what life was. Why didn't I know that before? Why didn't I know that he was the littlest of nine children? Why didn't I know about an island called Gozo? You know where Gozo is? Mm -mm. You know that there's... 
these uh, tunnels that uh, that connect all of those islands in the Mediterranean Sea. I did not. Uh, it's a f- fascinating, and the the, the island is. If I didn't see uh, Games of Thrones, I'd have no idea how gorgeous the island is. Mystical. I never and saw the show. All those sailors and those Phoenicians and all those people—they talked about nothing but the star people. Hmm. They knew they lived beneath the sea. They knew they lived in these uh, caves, you know. In the World War One, and Mussolini was bombing the hell out of that island of Malta. The people went into the cave. That's where they lived. They get away from it. That's how they survive. Mm-hmm. So, and they have stories to tell. It's and uh, and the good thing my grandfather's not around because he tell you the story how the Sant family and the Atard family from Gozo uh, rescued the Apostle Paul as he was shipwrecked off the island. Whoa! And uh, oh, please! And the the encounter he had was on a um, a huge gondola. And the family business was going out to the English Navy and picking up their laundry and bringing them in, or they became a water taxi. They'd bring the sailors in for their uh, leave. Uh, uh, and uh, on one of those return trips is where he saw an arm reaching out of the Mediterranean Sea. And he said, you know, son, we take an oath that us that live by the sea, if anybody is in danger of drowning, we take an oath that we have to use all of our resources, he said, to save that person's life. He said, so we took the gondola over. I pulled out this beam out of the Mediterranean Sea. He described it exactly as I described my visitation as a boy nine years old. Wow. So... Uh, and he lives on an island I never even heard of. You probably never said uh, uh, Gomeo or something like that. There's an island between Gozo and uh, and Malta that people actually live on. You know? I'm going to be doing some but, Google Earth and later. Oh, I hope you do. Mm-hmm. And I hope you look at all of this, these things. Uh, it's enriched my life. And, I'm intrigued uh, by these these concepts of antiquity and the tunnels and stuff that you're saying. I hadn't heard anybody say before that the uh, Mediterranean islands were, were connected under the sea. That's fascinating. You know, not to plug any particular show, but, uh, you know, I love ancient history and ancient aliens and things like that and how they just take factual things that you can look at and touch. And, you know, for, what in the world profit? Well, I know Georgie will make a little profit here and there, but he's quite an a, a, investigator i mean this guy will get up just like eric von daniken did you know he was a waiter he used his own money to to fly o- over different parts of the country nobody paid him at the beginning before he wrote that book mm-hmm. these are people with passions mm-hmm. so i want to have a passion like that eric you gave me a great opportunity please know i am open to any questions you have i, I know you're fascinated great. with the beings right now i'm curious i'm <laughs> curious a lot with um, <clears throat> excuse me so now the um the one thing that i think was a big shocker to me I, i'm intrigued because i i'm from new york as well so i'm i'm very happy to know that you are a first hand experiencer of the hudson valley situation i'm actually I, i'm i have a couple of questions on that one how would you express from your perspective, the size of what you were looking at? First of all, it was, it changed dimensions as far as angles go. When I first saw this object, it was in an L shape, hanging over my backyard. And I, of course, stopped. And uh, uh, by this time, the 84 interstate I-84, which you can Google also, is a very, very busy interstate from Albany down to uh, New York City, as you can well imagine. I've been on this it. happened on a Thursday evening, right around late commuter time, March 17th. And uh, uh, so, so it was, when it was, I saw it was light it, out. It was dusk out. It was okay. a quarter to eight. Okay. Okay. Got you. Yeah. And I had just driven from a church social, so I was not at, at any pub. I wasn't at the VFW or anything uh-huh. like that with a few beers. I was sober mind. 
And uh, we took all the children in. And as I got them ready for bed, one of, you know, the gut feelings you get, like, don't go over there or don't go over here, just pulled me outside. And I went outside, and now Interstate 84 was a parking lot. There had to be 100 cars parked off. People had gotten out of the cars, and they're standing, pointing up at the air. Now, at this point, it was a, a boomerang or a V-shape that, I would probably liken it more to a V shape. So this L I originally saw at the beginning now had rotated into a point that see if I can turn it towards you, mm -hmm. it came that way. Okay. So it was life. it was reorienting its position, but it was yes. dimensionally still maintaining, right? right? Exactly. So so the length exactly. of, so my curiosity is that um, how would you describe the size length and width so even when you're saying in its L shape what was its height and, and width best guess the, the height the height I'll never know okay. because it was well over what we call our tree line okay. probably a good football field I use football field as my measurement every place I go I'll okay. go well it's as wide as a football field it was as wide as a football field I would say 40 to 50 yards. Okay. Now, when I was blessed to spend a weekend with Dr. Heineck, uh, he immediately took a coin out of his, his uh, pocket and he said, Dennis, just move this coin back and forth and tell me when you completely block out where that object was. And I did, and I said, right there. And he looked at it and he goes, hmm, about 50 yards? I said, yeah, how could you tell that off of a, a quarter, you know? Mm -hmm. So... I learned a lot. He was a dear man. I'm sorry, Pat, but he was so interesting. And I asked him the same question that uh, you had asked me earlier, which was, how did a skeptic, don't forget he was appointed in 1947. I was born in 47. And he was appointed by the Air Force. Air Force just became the Air Force in 47. A lot of things. He's also a captain in the Air Force. Hmm. A lot of people didn't know. So he was really hired to debunk. He was an astronomer. He had a lot of degrees. He, he, he knew like everything. He was a disciple of, uh, of um, uh, what's, what's that genius? Albert Einstein. He quotes Albert Einstein and all of his theories. And, uh, and a gentle, humble man. So we had some great conversations. I said, so how did a skeptic like you become a believer? And he said, Dennis, all the hundreds of investigations I was on, am I going to tell that vice president of IBM? Am I going to tell that fighter pilot or the airplane pilot or somebody who has a, a, an IQ of a genius? Am I going to tell them the liars? Yeah. I mean, it's, he, he might be able to tell anybody else in the world. He might be able to convince yeah. anybody else that that person's not accurate. But you're not going to yeah. convince that uh, uh, experiencer. That's it. And, and he, for him to fly out, for him to spend so much time with the witnesses of the Hudson Valley, uh, he co-authored a book called Night Siege, which is all about that phenomenon. He co-wrote it with a man called Phil Imbrogno, uh, who wrote a lot of books dealing with stone chambers, which are also in my book. We have these uh, stone chambers that dot, um, oh, I would say, from New England right up into the Hudson River. Um, we've explored close to 200 of them. I have uh, I'm intrigued. Of them. I'm very happy to see somebody starting to do some real research on this because I, as a child, have climbed all over these structures that you're talking about yeah. in the woods in the Catskills. And I do sure. not believe what we are being told at all. I grew up to be a craftsman. I understand what labor is. If people actually understood the stone structures all over New England, the walls that are so deeply embedded in the ground that only the tips are sticking out um, are, are really, there, there's a massive system up there that's not been addressed correctly. No, and you find very few investigators that want to dip into their own pocket mm -hmm. 
like these men, like this guy Phil and Bragno, he's a science teacher, always putting in his pocket, always going here and traveling there and uh, using equipment. And uh, I just give all these people that uh, they want ufology. They want UFOs to be a, uh, a scientific pursuit. Uh, tired of it being part of the comic book uh, uh, knowledge. And I want that exactly too. I think we're, whether you be spiritual, you couldn't read the scriptures in the Bible or the Quran or any of those books without seeing there's a connection between us and beings from the heavens. Absolutely. Folks like Von Daniken have done due diligence in that direction. <clears throat> Excuse me. And doesn't eat today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's, um, I look at it in so many of our information streams, I look at it like mm -hmm. you can, if you follow the stream back to the source, you'll find the original fountain. You know? Connecting the dots, my friend. Exactly. Like you are doing. Yeah. I want everybody who reads my book, I want them to call up the grandfather and say, hey, what was it like when you were a little kid? Tell me about what color is your favorite. What ice cream? I didn't even know what ice cream you liked. Yes, all of those details matter, and our ancestors functioned more in that direction. These are great questions to just simply yes, call up, call up your aunt, like call up your great grandfather and have a discussion about his great grandfather, if you can. That's like that's the stuff that really needs to happen. Call up your grandfather and say, tell me everything you remember about your grandfather. Oh, Eric, you're, you're right on the right track over here. Yeah, that's how we and, learn and, and how we teach things generationally. That's where we get to where we say, if we don't learn from our history, we're doomed to repeat it. That happens on family lines if you don't understand, sure like, the, 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 sure the, 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 the sins of your family, so to say, the, the, the habits of your bloodline. These are chains that need to be broken as well. That's, you know, we have light work and we have shadow work and we have good pros on our family's lines and we have cons in our family lines. But by not even understanding our own personal history... You know, we can't grow you as are, individuals, and we can't grow to help each other. No, you, you are you are right on, spot on. I, I'm telling you, we miss a great opportunity here. And isn't it funny as uh, DNA has, has taken over forensics and all these things, and they can go back and get that little piece of hair and say, oh, the guy had blue eyes and blonde hair and a six-foot-two. And they're right. It's written in our DNA, mm -hmm. and so is the missing link. I grew up, you know, we'd always talk about the missing link. Uh, link. It, it must be a gorilla. It must be a monkey. It must be something from the primate age. Why couldn't it just be a species of being from someplace else? Mm -hmm. You know, as we look into Genesis, we see all these fallen angels. A hey, definition of an angel is a messenger. Doesn't mean that he has uh, wings on, and doesn't mean that he's a female, good looking, in a bathing suit. He's a, a messenger. So these people that call them star people, maybe they were talking to angelic beings. They seem mm -hmm. to be the same type. Mm -hmm. And I guess when I started before, I'm tired of seeing those that go on these UFO or alien type journeys that everything is negative evil, horrible, they're here to hurt us, they're here to take over. They're not here to take over. They're here to help us get over. I can follow uh, that. Even what, what I'm seeing in a lot of the disclosure that's coming out from the, well, the pseudo disclosure that's coming from the government, it seems like all the documentations or dissertations of the experts are having the conversations peppered heavily with terms yeah. like threat. You know, mm -hmm. it's and this to me is psyop stuff that's so obviously by design. The government disclosure is not currently disclosing anything. It's government programming. They have intentions. Their intention mm -hmm. is to convince you that the alien, uh, the unknown, scary stuff is a threat. Yeah. Because that's how the government works. That's how they get checks so that they can fund research and development to mitigate the threat. Because we're concerned now. Now we're concerned. After all of these years of not yeah. knowing what's going on, because they're still in the same position of basically saying something's going on, but we don't know what's going on. But now we're going to be honest about that. That's the only thing they did is disclose they had been lying. 
But with that being said, nothing's changed then. If they're going to say now we just realize that because we don't know what's going on, it's a threat, that's a lie because then they always didn't know what's going on, so the threat was always there. So why did they just now decide to discuss it and be concerned? I think the time's coming close. I, I think that we're reaching a point where you can't hide anymore, which – let mm -hmm. me tell you, do you ever have a picture of the dark side of the moon? Tell me what the dark side yeah. of the moon looks like, please. Mm -hmm. First of all, it's not dark. It's more light on the dark side of the moon than our side of the moon. How in the world, Eric, mm -hmm. can a planet or uh, a satellite be up there that we can't see the other side? Now, mm -hmm. we've been around it. Mm -hmm. How come we don't have one picture of it? Here's, you're right, and I, I see the direction that you're going. I think what's going to happen is that you're right. The, um, it's as if, for a very long time, the government has been able to keep the curtains closed on the stage yep. of UFOs, so to say. The curtains have been pulled back. They can't hide it anymore. But what they absolutely can and will be doing is putting their actors on the stage, which is what we're seeing sure. right now. Sure. The, the, the stage is open. They can't stop you, right? The technology is there. Everybody can look up in the sky with night vision goggles. They can see the UFOs. We have yeah. greater telescopes. We can see the things on the surface of the moon and track the lights. The, the stage is open. But what we're getting is these play actors, and they're going to start to present a threat. And they're just going to take their vehicles that they know they also made and have – uh, they're going to make it, they're going to make it look like there's an off-world threat for the purposes of control and you know just making things the way that they want them uh, you know we you up there in Alaska and I'm down here in New York but I tell you, you I feel like you're right around the corner we are on the same mm -hmm. point Sorry across the, the nation with Eric and Dennis. <laughs> Yeah, you. I cut you off, and I do that often. My wife tells me Don't you worry about wanted. It. You had to, you had some questions about the Hudson Valley uh, phenomena. Obviously, obviously, you're aware of some of the stuff that went on here. Mm -hmm. um, what questions would you have in that regard? I was so I fortunate. I have another curiosity, just for the big picture, connecting okay. the dots in your locale. Are you okay. familiar with the Indian Point UFO encounter? I am, and it was investigated by Phil Imbrogno. Okay. And it was right around the same time. Matter of fact, Heineck, when he was up here, mm -hmm. uh, and he was brought over uh, with this man, uh, Phil Imbrogno. Mm -hmm. And yes, they went out and interviewed security from the Indian point, which is now. Yes. Shut down. I, I, I've seen, I've seen those reports. <laughs> I've seen those reports and the testimonies were from very credible staff. And they yeah, said that, that, please. that massive object got within 100 yards of the reactor. Football field again, right? Yeah. <laughs> Everybody seems Something to like that. Football. They like that measurement. Yeah. 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 So yeah. Um, I, I tell you that, um, uh, that phenomena opens up a great dialogue, and now the people from from uh, social media, and, and certainly you go look at legitimate news. I mean, look at uh, Fox or Newsmax or or CNN, or and now they're delving into this that they're looking at it. There's a giggle here and a giggle there, but uh, it's a whole different approach they're using. Mm -hmm. And I tell you what, I, I wouldn't want to giggle at some general wearing four stars. Uh, uh, I find myself standing at attention. Mm -hmm. So uh, they have something to say. So this is where we are today, my friend. And, mm -hmm. and the book is all about that. Some people will come and tell you, oh, I had a sighting or I had a visitation. Mm -hmm. I had them all. Mm -hmm. And they just made sense after a while that this wasn't just per chance. This was for Dennis Sant to experience. You started to so realize. So now I can go for two generations in, on the island of Malta and three generations on the island of Puerto Rico. And the information I got, I couldn't even fit in this book. I didn't want to bore people. Mm -hmm. you know, I didn't want to bore them on, 
on how to uh, all these recipes for all these herbs and uh, and, and nowadays it's, it's like God placed these herbs on here to take care of these illnesses we have but then we go and we make these chemical things in laboratories around the world and we find ourselves eaten up by this people can study and certainly people the can study is one of the things people can study the history of homeopathic medicine and they will find that it's highly functional and those are the facts of life there's only the there's, there's only life. one medical doctor who has a statue erected to him in Washington DC I believe and I believe it was the one that founded homeopathic medicine but I apologize, I can't remember his name. Me neither, and that's okay. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm shameful to tell you, mm -hmm. I can't remember my great great grandmother's name either. But it was my <laughs> it was my understanding when this gentleman basically un un or I should say rolled out to the world his discovery of the function of homeopathic medicine. I think he got a Nobel Prize or something for it, and all kinds of accolades. And then all of a sudden, the Rockefeller foundation started investing in pharmaceuticals and chemicals mm. instead and then they were investing in the education of the medical doctors and they started giving out grants and such so these doctors can learn which pills to prescribe and that's where we got western medicine from so homeopathic came first was proven to work and then because it was proven to work but didn't require anything outside of your own kitchen because anybody could have a homeopathic apothecary in their home. Absolutely. Anyone can do it. But then we'd be fixing but ourselves. It's, but it's too much trouble to do. When you can take chemicals and have some pharmaceutical uh, company mm -hmm. make it, mm -hmm. where you would have to pick these things. Mm -hmm. There's the bark of, uh, I believe it's called the, um, uh, see, I'm trying to think of the name of the tree. That is only harvest during a full moon. And it starts with a T, and uh, it's in my book for sure. Mm -hmm. So much is in that book. But uh, they would have to go out at night, and it would glow in the moon. And that's when they picked it. Mm -hmm. That's when they brewed it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, it. It depends on what time of the day you're picking them. Yep. And this, uh, this is how Western medicine do and with them. This, this is how business and, and technology ruin things, right? So, it, like, sure. these things, like, you know, now all of a sudden there'll be a formula for that bark to do this, to do that, but they'll leave out the part that means harvested at moon. So you're not getting the same thing. Exactly. A lot of folks, like, so, for example, tobacco. Tobacco use in, in ancient times, it wasn't just for smoking tobacco. I mean, it had a, a certain medicinal value to smoke certain types of tobaccos to cure certain types of things. But there was other things that was done with tobacco, vast stuff. Because it was so effective, it basically became industrialized and commercialized. And through that process, look where we're at now. People basically look at tobacco as evil, ruined by an industry effectively, which is true. You know, the tobacco industry has ruined tobacco. They've also sure. ruined our concept and our ability to use it correctly. I would say you'd be very hard pressed to convince people that tobacco has a lot of medicinal value. But you, no, but it, it, it does maybe on the nervous system. You know, when, when I think of, do you ever have a, a, a Cuban cigar, hand rolled Cuban cigar? Mm -hmm. It's a different taste. You don't have, all the chemicals that right. are put in there to cure this mm -hmm. and cure that. And, uh, you know, I, I must confess along with other confessions that I love a little brandy and a, a nice little Cuban cigar. Fair enough. Yeah. I wouldn't knock yeah. you. The Dominican Republic, they do a good rolling job in those cigars too. There Don't want to leave them out. Fair, Fair enough. Play. <laughs> Give credit where credit hey. is due. Yeah. So, um, is there anything else that I can tantalize you or your mm. audience to sit and delve into opening their mind, becoming a seeker? And to be a seeker, you can't come in with a preconceived agenda or an idea. You got to walk with a blank sheet of paper and you fill it in as you actually experience it. I have, and, I mean, I have a question that I want to ask on behalf of my friend John Warner. 
because he is also a researcher and an author. And because of your experience and his, I guess, his mental direction, he's put a thought in my head. So he researches that on the battlefield that there is often a UFO presence, and he is stating that we lose, we MIA massive amounts of our forces to alien activities. Do you have any thoughts or experiences in that capacity? Since it sounds like you were researching the exact same thing and he's talking to the tunes. He's saying that he knows guys that have gone out, you know, night ambush ops and stuff like that. And he said never that come back. they never come back. And he goes, and they didn't encounter anything necessarily. He goes, they go out, they go out a thousand strong, they come back and they're missing 300. And they just didn't, there was no, there was no contact, nothing. And sometimes he says that they would say that they would see things, but it certainly wasn't Viet Cong or anything. No, I have not. I've heard the rumors and I hear more after a okay. couple of cold ones and uh, sitting mm -hmm. in, the, in, in, the, in the MCO club. But uh, no, I, I, I haven't heard that. Okay. I do know that there are missing people, Americans and so forth. Mm -hmm. And have they been abducted? I had a problem with abduction until I uh, met this wonderful lady uh, who was uh, extremely uh, bright and uh, a department head in Putnam County. And uh, she believed that she was abducted and examined. And uh, she's not a millionaire for this. Actually, she moved from uh, New York down to Florida during this whole episode of us going to talk shows. And uh, you'll see her on, you go to YouTube, you'll, you'll see uh, my show with... Uh, um, uh, Richard Bay and uh, and uh, people are talking and um, you'll see her there too. You'll see uh, um, uh, Bud Hopkins who wrote many of the books on books on missing time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, during that time, I was also put, put under hypnosis by people from the UFO uh, Foundation and uh, brought to. To me by uh, Bud Hopkins. Cool. So another another story for another day. You got it. Absolutely. That sounds fantastic. Uh, I really appreciate all the information that you shared today. And um, why don't you hold up your book again and let everybody know? Um, well, thank you. No, I'm no so problem. proud of it. And, and yeah. thank you for the opportunity of sharing my story. No, thank you so much. This is just the tip of the iceberg. I hope we get to uh, get a chapter two conversation with you in the not too distant future. And everybody oh, should, should uh, check out Dennis's book. I will absolutely have links down below so everybody can take a look at it. And um, I highly recommend that, you know, people share their stories like Dennis because this is what we need to do nowadays to, you know, get the truth out there because the government certainly isn't rushing to tell really? us the truth. I think they were just uh, kind enough to unlock the door and leave it open, but it's time for folks like Dennis and myself and everybody out there who has experiences to go running through that door and let us know what truth you have to share. So thank you very much, everybody, for coming today. Thank you, Dennis. Eric, you're a class act, and you have a wonderful show, and thank you for allowing me to tell my story and not for making me feel foolish. I've never felt so comfortable. Awesome. You, uh, you keep doing what you got to do. I'm no investigator, so please don't put me in the category of some of those great, great men. I was just lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time. Ten Whoever four. thought two hours of the Dalai Lama, a weekend with Dr. Heineck, stop it. I had enough. We didn't even get to the Dalai Good Lama, thing. so we'll have to talk again. Oh, we'll make one show just his, and he loves talking about extraterrestrials. Excellent. <laughs> there you go. I look yeah. forward to it, Dennis. Thank okay. you so much. And uh, have Take an care. excellent day. And thank you, everybody, for coming to Deciphering.tv. You made my day. Thank you very much.